All right, yeah, so yeah, I guess maybe Jeff, I know you're talking a bit about uh, about Dish, kind of what they're viewed there. Maybe get your view on on Dish and perhaps even some other uh, Spectrum holders there up and uh, kind of that have, have have Spectrum in their in their hands right now, or at least trying to get Spectrum in their hands. Yeah, sure, Dan. Yeah, the the, the uh, uh, Dish has been kind of, uh, kind of an interesting um, uh, entity in, in Washington. I'm not. Um, I, I think you know uh, Washington doesn't have you know any better idea than the rest of the country about uh, what their plans are, and I think uh, <laughs> Charlie keeps you know a number of balls in the air all the time. And uh, but uh, as uh, Bill was saying, um, you know they they are a player by default. But um, what I will say, it you know at some point. Um, uh, you know, I, I think the window, um, you know, is is narrowing. I think it's narrowed in the past uh, 12 months as to, you know, uh, you know how, how, from their point of view, best monetize it because you had the, um, you know, the the Sprint uh, or the SoftBank Sprint deal, the Sprint Clearwire deal, and I think given you know uh, uh, competition policy uh, as it stands today. Um, uh, you know, I, I think Dish would be limited, uh, really, uh, uh, to partnering either with T-Mobile and perhaps Sprint. But um, uh, you know, any sort of partnership with Sprint would help. You know, it would seem to help Dish a lot more than it would help Sprint. Sprint's looking for market share, yeah. and so that that sort of uh, um, so so we don't know. And 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 uh, let's not forget, um, you know, Light Squared. Um, is still out there. Um, you know, they 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 have um, um, or or trying to retain, and, and there's been some positive signals uh, um, from you know their their uh, bankruptcy proceeding, and you know they had a they had a wholesale uh, model that uh, I, I assume that if they emerge from bankruptcy, they still plan to uh, pursue, and and uh, you know so that could be another source. Of spectrum um, going forward, but again, um, it would be uh, um, if they're sticking to their original plan, it would be more wholesale. And 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 of course, the way the rules were written, there was kind of like a mother may I, um, you know, provision for AT&T and Verizon, um, you know, in those rules. So if you know either of those two companies um, wanted to lease spectrum. Um, from Light Squared, uh, you know, they, they they would have to get uh, run run it by the FCC first uh, on that. So you know that that is still out there um, as well, and uh, and you know it's important to note that um, that that all of these, it's hard to tell which one is going to be most meaningful because a big X factor in all of this is we don't know. Uh, to what extent, uh, how successful the incentive auction will be. So we don't know what that's going to net, and and so, uh, you know, spectrum-wise. So it could well be that you know the AWS three auction, you know, in hindsight may turn out, uh, you know, to to be uh, even more significant. Um, it, it's just re really hard to tell. There's a lot of moving parts. Yeah, obviously, the incentive auction is going to be that, that is definitely going to be a tricky proposition. I think we'll, we'll touch on that a bit here too. But 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 yeah, I, I think yeah, it does seem like with, with Light Square and and the, the Light Square issue, which has been going on for years and years, it seemed like that was almost one of the first attempts by the FCC under Janikowski to kind of really get new spectrum out there. I mean, he he almost seemed like they they tried to fast track that that deal through, uh, you know, and then obviously the GPS community came in and and, and voiced their opinions and uh, kind of shut that down. But, uh, but yeah, the, the light squared spectrum is still sitting out there. At least some of it's got to be, you know, can be used. It seems for for one of the services. Just a matter of how you're going to work that through bankruptcy. And obviously, the FCC has a bit of a history when it comes to bankrupt companies as well. When it comes to you know looking back at next wave and other companies too. So uh, there's a lot of tricky tricky propositions there for the FCC with light squared. But uh, but but with Dish, I mean, you know, if if they can get their hands on some spectrum and if they're going to uh, uh, with more spectrum and and, and partner with uh, Sprint. Uh, I think it'd be nothing better, at least from a reporter point of view, than watching uh, Masayoshi San and uh, and uh, Charlie Ergen work together on, on trying to uh, put a, put some sort of agreement together. Those are two probably biggest egos in the industry. Uh, so seeing those two work together would be kind of fun. But uh, uh, I don't know. But yeah, we'll see, I guess see how that plays out. But 
but but I guess yeah, I guess looking forward to to AWS three, uh, there has been some talk you know, the past week or so from uh, from carriers about uh, I, I guess maybe some rumors coming out about some some rulemaking there. I know Jeff, you mentioned that a little earlier about some, for some potential rulemaking on that. Uh, what's the view on on when that when that when I guess when that's expected to come out, uh, uh, and and maybe what those rules perhaps might might even be. Okay, so on the AWS three, uh, I believe the FCC has it um, on their agenda for the uh, May or excuse me the March thirty uh, first meeting. So we, okay. we um, you know so we'll have um, uh, more clarity on AWS three um, you know in, in a couple weeks here. Um, and then um, uh, I believe also uh, not, not to be overlooked. I think at the same meeting, um, uh, the FCC will be um, uh, holding a vote on um, five gigahertz, you know, unlicensed spectrum. Yes. Um, so that's significant. And perhaps in April, um, the FCC. Um, May go forward uh, with an initiative on a three three point five gigahertz. I think it's micro cell. Yeah, for small cell. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then that that that'll be um, April. And then in May, uh, the May time frame, what we may see is um, uh, something from the FCC on the incentive auction framework. And either before the incentive auction framework comes out, or Simultaneous, you know, with that in May, um, uh, we may have, um, you know, uh, uh, guidance from the FCC on the spectrum screen as well. Uh, again, uh, uh, the intention is to give, um, you know, all prospective bidders as much information on the spectrum screen um, in advance. You know, uh, of the upcoming auctions, it's a little tricky what the sequencing will be um, for all that. But um, so th th there's going to be a lot of activity, um, you know, uh, this spring and beyond on, on the spectrum uh, front. And then, you know, it, it in the same time frame, um, uh, we should get more clarity on um, the light squared bankruptcy proceeding um, as well. And I think. You know, with all those in play, that could in turn, you know, impact, um, uh, you know, what DISH uh, does going forward. Um, so, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a lot of moving parts, and, um, and 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 it could turn out any number of ways uh, going forward. But you know, the rest of the year is going to be very active on on the spectrum policy front. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess maybe from Bill, I guess what's your view on how how carriers may react to all these various uh, pieces that are going to start coming up. I mean, obviously, you know, AWS three is going to be big. You know, that's going to impact uh, incentive auction, uh, the waiting issue. Uh, I mean, carriers really have to kind of plan their next move carefully here. It seems like. Yeah, I think that uh, what we saw yesterday from the ATT blog VP of regulatory Joe Marsh uh, yeah. applauded it. I think also Verizon applauded it, and then sure enough, T-Mobile said we don't necessarily agree with it. Yes, so today. it's a war. It's a, it's all positioning, and whoever has the good argument or the better uh, lobby is, <laughs> or, you know, it, not not really lobbyists for 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 FCC, but uh, you know the, the the logic and the argument and, and the soundness of that argument is should should uh, rule the day in terms of going that direction. Uh, so. You know, I, I don't have any visibility on, on the regulatory stuff that that uh, that Jeff has. So it would be interesting to hear uh, to see actually what what becomes of it. Uh, and you know, feel feel for the FCC trying to be all things to all people, be the most fair uh, and for the public good. But uh, as far as um, planning, yeah, I think that that's within uh, the the corporate strategy is to look at spectrum because it's all strategic. Assets and to acquire more strategic assets is kind of the name of the game. So playing well ahead, and um, that's why if you listen to investor conferences, they they always talk about are you gonna what's your position like uh, for 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 capex and capital for to for upcoming auctions. So yep. you know, big part of it is certainly uh, the money to to uh, go up and and maybe bid big. Yeah, and obviously that, that connects too. I mean, I, I know people have been asking uh, Verizon about their AWS plans. 
uh, how they're going to roll that out. And that obviously directly impacts what their CapEx is going to be as well. I mean, they've got the spectrum already. Uh, they've talked about, you know, rolling that out more and more. So that's going to uh, perhaps keep their CapEx maybe a little at higher levels than they were expecting it to be. I know, you know, I think early last year, they were talking longer term at, at kind of rolling down some of their CapEx into 2014. Uh, once 700 megahertz got rolled out for the most part, but uh, but all of a sudden with this need to, to roll more AWS to support uh, uh, their, their LTE network, it seems like capex spending for them at least in the near term is going to be at that same probably at that, that same level for the most part uh, until they can really start rolling it back. So yeah, it does it does seem like that you know having that spectrum does equate to uh, if you're going to put it into play, you've got to you got to spend some money too. Yeah, looking ahead, I mean, just to inject on spectrum uh, on the near term stuff, I think we're going to be uh, the consumer is going to be the beneficiary of it. So we've been covering a topic called carry aggregation for the longest time, for many years, right? And I think we'll see, actually we're probably seeing the fruits of it in certain, certain markets already. Uh, and we'll see that and it, it'll be the speed positioning. I think I, I and several other people have talked about it and that's what Sprint is um, putting, the, putting the, you know, throwing their hat in the ring and saying where this is going to be a speed king, even yeah. though T-Mobile and, and Verizon and AT&T are kind of going at the edges on each other. but. We know that carry aggregation is basically putting together disparate spectrum, whether it's contiguous or not contiguous, whether it's the same band or other other, other band. That's kind of going to be it in the future to use existing stuff, and that goes towards refarming uh, into giving us, you know, the good consumer a faster experience and a, a, a better latency experience. Yeah, and also that reforming, yeah, black. and the, the, the reforming part's a big part of it too. I mean, I know we touched about it on the, on the webinar, but I mean that's going to be a big part of this because obviously carriers are already talking about reforming their their 2G spectrum, obviously, but even even some of their 3G spectrum, uh, PCS bands and whatnot to, to support LTE. So that's that's a tricky proposition in itself, uh, trying to get that worked out because because again that's that's moving customers and, and you, know, you don't want to lose customers and move them too quickly. Uh, so that's a whole uh, marketing uh, angle that needs to be needs to be tackled too. I think looking ahead, at least for the devices, we're going to, because of, of the constant turnover in devices, whenever you bring in new technology, there's going to be built into new devices. So that, that's going to be another uh, piece of it. You know, if you want faster speed, you're going to have to upgrade your device, your tablet, or your, your smartphone uh, to realize those, those fast speeds. Good for, you know, the, the, the whole ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, now, uh, maybe touch a bit about maybe off the, off the auctions for a second. I mean, obviously, Incentive auction will be a big one that's coming up. That'll take, you know, that could be a five-hour discussion there, uh, but we don't have this go too much longer. But, uh, but I guess, Jeff, maybe gets from your point of view, you, you kind of brought up that, you know, in the, uh, in the next uh, FCC uh, uh, meeting they're going to have in March, uh, there was talk about some of uh, the unlicensed spectrum, the 5 gigahertz band. Uh, I, I guess, you know, that, there's always that, that you know, uh, a need to, to get more unlicensed spectrum out there. I mean, the 2.4, which has kind of been supporting Wi-Fi for the most part, has been, uh, it's, been it's being used pretty thoroughly, it seems like, in a lot of areas. Uh, is the FCC good, putting a lot more focus, do you think, on that unlicensed spectrum ban? And, and I guess what's the support coming, uh, I guess, across the, the, the policy range when it comes to, to more spectrum for the unlicensed uh, uh, uses? Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I think they've got it uh, clearly. They, they, they can see that, um, you know, in the wireless space that uh, there needs to be a mix of yeah. licensed and unlicensed spectrum. And I think they're 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 putting uh, a lot of time and a lot of effort, um, you know, into that. Even in the incentive auction, uh, not not not, uh, uh, you know, it's still an open question, um, though, though it gets debated a lot in town here. Um, you know, uh, to what extent uh, should you know any spectrum, whatever spectrum is recovered uh, from broadcasters. Um, should that be uh, made available uh, for unlicensed? I mean, most will be for licensed, but you know, there's a lot of debate, uh, and I'm sure it will be renewed. It's kind of settled down, um, and I and I think when you know they're looking um, at spectrum policy, um, you know, they're taking a very holistic approach insofar as uh, you know they're looking at um, transactions spectrum creation by auction and what are the rules you know and and um, uh, opportunities for sharing what's you know uh, wh whether government spectrum um, can be shared or reallocated more in the future and that, that's a very tough nut to crack uh, there that um, there was you know um, 
a significant amount that was you know reallocated during the 90s and and I think um, uh, you know uh, Department of Defense and other agencies are very wary about uh, um, you know making more spectrum available but uh, there's this constant fight in Washington about well how much is there how much could be made uh, uh, available from the federal government spectrum and so there's kind of a constant refrain of uh, we need to inventory federal government spectrum um, but uh, you know that th that hasn't yielded you know much in the way um, you know of deliverables and, and and the reason is it's just very very it's a very difficult process you know um, uh, you know for a number of reasons but I think you know unlicensed uh, you know is going to play a uh, you know a huge part, especially you know, if you look at uh, some of the cable companies, which you know they 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 um, uh, sold a lot of their uh, spectrum to Verizon, yeah. and um, and now you know they're they're going big into uh, and have been in, in, into Wi-Fi, um, you know, to create you know ha have another platform, a wireless platform for different devices, you know, for all their uh, products, you know, both uh, you know uh, you know video and otherwise. Yeah. Um, and so um, it, it's it's an important piece of the pie. Yeah, obviously, yeah, that'll be a big part. And if, if it comes to 600 megahertz, I mean, I know there's a lot of uh, uh, desire to uh, get as much money as possible out of 600 megahertz. So uh, giving away some of that for uh, unlicensed might right. be a, a tricky proposition there when it comes to first net funding and stuff too. But but yeah, maybe from Bill, I guess your your view on kind of how the the market's kind of dealing with uh, unlicensed right now. I mean, obviously, uh, carriers have always had kind of a uh, arm's length uh, deal with unlicensed uh, spectrum. Uh, you know, with more coming to market, uh, what's what's your kind of general view of, of how that might impact uh, carrier plans? Um, I think from the unlicensed viewpoint, it's it's kind of Wi-Fi uh, yeah. in the near term that has been uh, good offload, and yeah. you know, carriers care about license more obviously because they can control it, they can give the quality of service experience. That uh, people want to pay for, but unlicensed is, is interesting simply because uh, it's unlicensed. You and I can have Wi-Fi routers, but um, cable Wi-Fi, the, the cable consortium, is monetizing it. AT&T is monetizing it uh, for you know in stadiums and things like that. So yeah. uh, unlicensed will, I think, you know, it, it's 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 a business model. If it ain't broke, don't don't play around with it. It will continue to to monetize in the ways that we know now. Uh, so getting more of that because uh, you know, if, if people are using data more in the licensed stuff, imagine what it is on the unlicensed stuff, right? So, from the demand standpoint, you need you need more of that stuff out there. And again, it's good for the ecosystem because we're going to have to have more new routers and things like that. Yeah, yeah, that's gonna be a bit of a challenge. And obviously, when it comes to small cells, I think it's a pretty similar point of view too. I know Jeff mentioned you know, the FCC is looking at using 3.5 uh, for small cells, which uh, it's it's kind of high up in the band, so it, it makes sense for a small cell, short range location right. type of thing. Um, that seems to make a lot of sense. Um, you know, did, Jeff, does it seem like that the three dot five uh, spectrum is is kind of moving along at, at a good clip? Do you think it'll be something that that might be freed up here uh, in, in the short term, or what's what's kind of the, the long range view? Yeah, it looks like yeah, it looks like they're um, it, it lo looks like they're making real you know real good progress on it, and um, and I wouldn't be surprised um, you know if we didn't have you know some sort of Initiative going forward, you know, in, in the in the spring uh, time frame. There, I like to go uh, back to one of the things uh, Bill said and get, kind of get his um, uh, and yours as well, Dan. You know, on the whole, um, the whole the whole cable Wi-Fi um, push. Um, you know, I, I wondered to myself that you know they're you know going in it. Really, more aggressively than the wireless carriers. On the one hand, for for, for the wireless, it, it helps um, with the offload issue. But one wonders where the point of diminishing returns is, and 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 maybe you know the the cable guys have answered that question because you wonder that if because there are data caps, I guess uh, on most carriers, I guess even Sprint, I suppose, has its limits if you go above it. But um, if if you know the, the cable guys uh, push this so hard, and you know you've got these uh, uh, you know these data uh, caps or limits, um, 
you know, on, on phones, uh, I wonder, and maybe Bill, you want to chime in here, is there a possibility that the, uh, some of the, uh, you know, the ARPU and data revenues um, could be under pressure, you know, the, from the carriers, you know, with, with you know, the, the cable Wi-Fi proliferation? Uh, so uh, I'll weigh in. I'll, I'll be interested in hearing Dan's opinion too, because he's he too is an analyst. Uh, so the, the the cable Wi-Fi stuff is, is I think by default uh, certain cable companies uh, wireless strategy because it, it rewind back to the old pivot days where they they uh, uh, partnered with Sprint didn't really work out. Uh, people weren't really uh, going to ditch their their wireless service from another brand. To uh, a whole, um, you know, quadruple play. Uh, there are th those who, who do it, but you know, if, if you look at the the cable Wi-Fi build out versus the traditional AT&T Wi-Fi uh, wi group build out, the AT&T uh, approach is hotspots. So it's hotspots of McDonald's, Barnes and Nobles, you know, the old uh, Starbucks and, and coffee shops. So that was kind of discreet, as opposed to the cable guys, which are kind of led by uh, Cable vision. Take a, if those people look in those days, it was more of a wireless coverage. So it's not hotspots. It's it's having clouds and the ability to be kind of quasi nomadic and mobile. You know, you can go down the street and you can still be within coverage. So it's interesting because that's their strategy. Because if you try to hook up to it. It's going to be similar to if you go to the airport, a Boingo experience. Well, you know, if you want a, a, an hour, pay this much, a day, this much. Okay, so you got that going. But by the fact that they have a, a cellular coverage and they've strung stuff probably on poles and they've got right away in, in customer stuff, uh, they could be a platform where they can kind of monetize that and offer, uh, I guess, hosting for small cells. For, you know, for 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 mobile carriers, so the enemy is is also my friend if they can uh, pay me money. So I mean that that's not unique in, in in today's business environment, but they they have in certain experience in certain cities they have the ability to 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 host small cells uh, for the wireless operators. Could that not also be? Me. Go ahead. No, you're good, Jeff. Yeah, I was just wondering, couldn't it uh, also be an opportunity for cable companies, um, you know, even to monetize it just uh, for advertising? Let's say if these, uh, you know, if, if these uh, hotspots are around uh, business areas where there's restaurants and so forth, the idea of knowing, um, you know, that uh, this is, you know, where somebody is, um, you know, could bring in maybe even some ad revenue, uh, one would think there, because, you know, the whole idea, you know, is, is they're going to be at a place or in a location uh, a lot of times of entertainment, and there might be other places close, you know, close by as well. Yeah, I think absolutely that that, that is certainly a capability. But if you take a look, I mean, I just focus on where the big numbers come from. If you host uh, and you have recurring revenue from uh, wireless operators because they mm -hmm. put their equipment on your, your poles and things like that. I think by far that's more stable recurring yep. revenue yep. than I agree. high revenue. Right. That's the, sure. you know. Dan, it's your turn. I, I want to hear what Dan says. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, the whole cable industry has definitely had a very unique uh, position when it comes to wireless. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I agree with you guys. I, I think, you know, I think I think cable companies realize that they could not compete in the wireless traditional wireless world. Uh, you know they have a lot of money, so they, they did buy some licenses. They dabbled here and there, but then they realized that this was not how they were going to make this work. Uh, they sold off their spectrum, which was smart. Uh, get some of that money back, uh, most of the money back, or if not all the money back. Uh, but yeah, I mean the Wi-Fi play seems to be more up their alley. I mean it seems like again these are these are content companies who are transmitting content. Uh, you know no matter unless you have 100 megahertz of license spectrum, uh, it's hard to really be a, a video transmitter company. So uh, tapping into Wi-Fi seemed like a great way to do that. You know, there's not, not much of an issue of, of you know, uh, of having to throw more money at spectrum all the time. So it seemed like it was a pretty smart play by them uh, to kind of focus on Wi-Fi. And, and again, with the carriers being somewhat arm's length with Wi-Fi for the most part, uh, it seemed like an, a, a great opportunity for them to, to dive into. So uh, yeah, I mean, it seemed like it was, it's a smart move by them. I think um, it, it plays into their strengths more, um, you know, yep. it keeps them out yep. directly with carriers, 
uh, you know, again, and with the data cap thing, I mean, that's a, that's a great point of view. I mean, you know, if, if carriers or if a cable company can now, you know, go to the customers and say, hey, you know, you sign up for our Wi-Fi mobile service, uh, there's, there's no caps. You can download and stream all you want with us. You know, sign up for our, our, our cable package, we'll give you this, where with the, the traditional wireless carriers, I mean, they're going to be, you know, having to, to, to rein in those, those data caps more and more as it goes along. So uh, it, it seems like a smart move by the cable guys. I mean, it's, you know. Yeah, I, I, I think I – think, I, I think it's brilliant, and I think uh, it's not only uh, – there, there, there's another component to it as well, that there's kind of a stickiness that if you're able not, you know, to basically have your video product, you know, uh, away from where you are, I mean, that's a value added, um, you know, in a market which is seeing a lot of pressure, you know, from uh, over the top providers, and so you know that that would be you know uh, uh, I, I would think you know the, the, the Wi-Fi component would be very helpful in in you know trying to reduce churn um, you know among you know uh, video subscribers. It would seem like a, a, a very strong um, uh, you know a, a, a kind of value-added proposition. For you know uh, uh, subscribers, to, you know uh, for cable subscribers, I would think. Yeah, I, I, I concur wholeheartedly. So recall uh, the term TV everywhere. This is, I think, a, a good good uh, segue to, to talk about that because you take a look at Comcast, right? They're, they're going to be doing away with set top boxes, and their X1 product is basically a cloud based uh, DVR, or well, not DVR, but you know that function, yeah. and to have free access and not having customers drain their uh, mobile data buckets from carriers and having it through Wi-Fi and because you're a member of Comcast, Time Warner, whatever, uh, and having that access free and watching your content is is part of the TV where everywhere strategy. So it, it is sure. part and parcel of it. And I think that if if, if they build it and the platform's there, wholesale is an opportunity if, if, um, if it's can be uh, said, you know, can be made to the mobile wireless carriers, mobile carriers. Yeah, yeah, and of course, all this is good. That the more Wi-Fi is also good for the edge players because the the more opportunity is also the more potential for eyeballs for all the all, all the you know the, the the big edge players of the world. You know, the the the, the Googles and and Facebooks and Amazons and so forth. You know, it there there's you know uh, more than residual benefit you know for those players as well yeah yeah and i and i, and I guess what you're talking about bill too is you know if, if these wife if these cable guys are putting these wi-fi hotspots all over the place you know a lot of this equipment now is coming with uh, you know you could embed a small cell in there as well for back call or for, or for whatever you want to do so uh, for cable companies like you said they could be you know i think they're already getting bigger and bigger into into wired back call uh, with their assets but you know putting these up it's, it's another opportunity to do even wireless back call as well so uh, you know, again, another revenue stream for them uh, going forward too. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'm I'm not a big fan of the cable companies, but uh, in this position, they are doing a pretty, I think, a pretty smart move by uh, uh, kind of getting out of the cellular industry and getting more into the unlicensed uh, industry at this point. So, right. So when when you deploy a small cell, two things you have to worry about is power and backhaul, right? So if they have a, a pole that has uh, facilities to, to 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 bring back the data as well as like say power reconnect or, or wherever the case may be, then then you're golden. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, guys, uh, we're just about out of time here. Uh, I definitely want to thank uh, Bill Ho with uh, Five Five Six Ventures for joining us today. Bill, thanks so much. We appreciate that, and also Jeff Silva, who's uh, uh, a, a RCR Wireless alum uh, who uh, carried this magazine uh, for for a long time, and we are still reaping the benefits of that. Uh, but he's now with uh, Global Medley Investors or Advisors, I should say. So, uh, Jeff, I uh, definitely appreciate the insight today. Thanks so much for that. Thanks for having me. Great. And, again, thanks, Bill, for, for your time, too. And, and again, like I was saying earlier, uh, we did do a, a webinar on this topic uh, last week that you can find on our website at rcrwireless.com uh, and also uh, a report on, on the topic as well. So please feel free to go to our website there and check those out for some more information. But, but again, guys, thanks so much for your time today. We, we appreciate it. No problem. Thank you.